are closely approaching this year's special 200th year anniversary of Joseph Smith's first vision and general conference. There have been many people that have expressed their opinions and predictions for this upcoming event. I personally feel that the writing is on the wall, as Daniel might say. When we look at all the church is doing, I think it is clear that certain things will happen. I want to share my predictions and the justifications of these predictions. So first, I want to give you my predictions. Then I will explain why I have come to these conclusions. First, I believe the church will give a new standardized first vision account, much like the new first vision video playing in the Church History Museum's 360 degree screen. Second, that the church will decanonize the pearl of great price. This does not mean that it will be removed from the church. These writings will more likely be placed with Joseph Smith's writings that the church has already been publishing over these recent years. My final pr prediction is that the conference will focus on the teachings of Jesus Christ as in the Book of Mormon. I believe that these are obvious moves and I will now present all the evidence why conference would be done in this way, as well as the evidence that this has been considered for quite some time. First, I want to point out that my second prediction is partially caused by the first prediction. My first prediction is that the church will give a new standardized first vision. If you go to the Church History Museum in Salt Lake, you can watch the new first vision video. It is quite impressive because it is on a 360 degree screen and you can watch it all around you as Joseph walks up past you and then prays. This new version combines all four of Joseph's handwritten accounts of his first vision, primarily the 1832 version, which is the first written account. The canonized version of Joseph Smith's vision was written in 1838. I previously have recorded videos discussing how they are different and why they differ. If you are unaware of these things, I would suggest that you watch those videos. That is episode 32, 33, and 34 of the Book of Mormon Scripture Challenge. The 1838 version of the first vision was not canonized until the October Conference of 1880, but not because all four versions were there and they examined them closely, uh, no. The main reason is it was chosen is that the 1838 and 1842 were the only published accounts. Most everyone had copies of the 1838 vision that they had saved from periodicals and Mormon publications. Both these two versions are very similar, but the 1838 has a better reading flow. So when it came time to say, should this be scripture, there was no question about what should be published while the 1832 and 1835 sat comfortably unremembered and forgotten in the archives of the church until sometime in the mid 20th century. Even after they were found, no effort was ever made to publish it until the 21st century. The reason I believe the church will release a new standardized first vision and decanonize the 1838 is that they have already filmed one combining all four visions and secondly, that it would not make sense to claim the 1832 version has the truth in it while the 1838 is the only true version. All written versions need to be viewed at the same level. We give a lot more emphasis to canon over normal history. Now, if you have not seen the Joseph Smith papers that the church created so that we can read these writings, then I suggest that you take the time to look them up. All four versions are recorded in the Joseph Smith papers already, as well as the learn more section of the scripture and study section on the church website. But the church may place them in other places as well to make them more accessible. Now, I want to point out that the Joseph Smith history is not the only thing in the Pearl of Great Price. We now need to talk about what the church will do with the other books of the Pearl of Great Price. What will happen to the Book of Moses, Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith, Matthew, and Articles of Faith? First, let's make it clear that they will not be removed from the church literature. We will still use them and study them, but they will be held differently.
to understand why we need a 30 second bit of history on these books before we can continue. The Joseph Smith translation books were all written between 1830 and 33. The Book of Abraham between 1835 and 42. The papyrus from the Book of Abraham was given to a museum after Joseph's death and thought to be lost in the Chicago fire. Then a momentous discovery happened in the mid 20th century. In 1966, fragments of the Book of Abraham were found. Everyone sat excitedly in silence waiting for the textual critics to come out and declare the truth. But that day never came. Instead, it was published that these texts were funeral scrolls, and the church historians and apologists, such as Hugh Nibley, wrote responses to explain how these images and facsimiles inspired Joseph when their similarities to Hebrew writings. This meant that the scrolls were just a source of inspiration to channel the Book of Abraham. I believe that leaders in the church were afraid to discuss the validity of the Book of Abraham because that would lead to questioning everything in the church. And with time, that moment in history was forgotten. And all seemed well. The church then began to buy up all church history that they could find and store it away in the archives. Gordon B. Hinckley bought a lot of this material. To no surprise, he loved his history. But most of this material was not released until President Monson was prophet of the church. During Thomas Monson's presidency, he supervised the writing of many of the church essays titled The Gospel Topic Essays. These essays discussed the validity of the Book of Abraham and First Vision accounts. You can find these essays on the church website and read them for yourself. I personally found them in 2015 and read them then. Now, with President Nelson, he is pushing to put everything into the members' hands. It has felt very fast with the amount of changes and materials given to us suddenly after years of not talking about it. I believe President Nelson will begin this conversation about the extra biblical texts found in the Pearl of Great Price. That is why he specifically mentioned the Pearl of Great Price in his invitation to prepare for conference. We know that the Book of Moses was received by inspiration, not translation, as well as the rest of the Joseph Smith translations. Many church historians feel that the Book of Abraham was also received by inspiration, not translation. Now. Never does Joseph ever in all of his writings show any notion that he was trying to deceive anyone. His personal journal gives the feelings of his absolute sincerity that he was receiving everything from God and not of himself. He wrote many prayers in his personal journal. And in 1832, after working on the Joseph Smith translation, he prayed, Oh my God, grant that I may be directed in all my thoughts. Oh, bless thy servant. Amen. November 28th. This day, I have spent it in reading and writing. This evening, my mind is calm and serene, for which I thank the Lord. Oh, how marvelous are thy works, O Lord! And I thank thee for thy mercy unto me, thy servant. O Lord, save me in thy kingdom, for Christ's sake. Amen. Similar writings fill his personal writings. These are his personal prayers that were not shared. They were not public statements. It is clear that Joseph was sincere, and I feel there is an inspiration behind these texts, but they are not the correction of the original text. And I think Joseph believed the same. A proof of this is that Joseph, after finishing his inspired texts, did not teach for them. Instead, he learned Hebrew, and he began to teach from the original Hebrew. Records show that Joseph also studied Greek, Latin, and German. These original languages shaped Joseph and many of his sermons before his death in 1844. Joseph began his studies in 1835. Why would Joseph need to study Hebrew if God had already revealed to him the hidden truth of the Old Testament? 
If you have studied Hebrew, you would know that Hebrew is a language rich in meaning. Words in Hebrew have more meaning and clarity in their relationship and in grammar than English does. There are all sorts of fun hidden meanings in numbers and, in, and poetry. The original text of the Bible can provide a lot to us today, and Joseph recognized this. I have recorded some videos that help explain this relationship of the original text, and I suggest you watch it to help you understand. I do not believe that the church will declare the books of the Pearl of Great Price as uninspired, because frankly, there is inspiration in these books. You can clearly see the preaching from the end times, from the beginning to the end in these books, and they are full of theophanies that teach us the readings more about Christ, our Savior, which is the most important aspect of the scriptures. However, these books are like the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees are important books of the Bible that are not included in the canonized text. That teaches us about the Jewish history that fulfills prophecy from biblical times such as Daniel and Zechariah. Understanding the fulfillment of Maccabees helps us understand other prophecies that are in the New Testament found in places such as Luke and Acts. The book of Maccabees, however, is not canonized due to inaccuracies. I believe that the conversation that the church did not have in 1960s about the Joseph Smith inspired text will finally happen. These books can still teach us important things, but I believe that President Nelson will ask us questions to guide us in our thoughts on these inspirations and present lessons to lead us to consider our Savior Jesus Christ and how we can study to learn more about Him to grow in our walk and faith. This brings me to the third point, that the conference will focus on the Book of Mormon. If you have been watching my channel, you have seen how the Book of Mormon presents the good news of Jesus Christ, that He would descend below us all, that He may be lifted up with Him. The Book of Mormon presents the gospel of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and what it means towards our salvation. I hope that the video that I have made in preparation for General Conference can be uplifting and helpful for you to recognize the gospel truth found in the Book of Mormon. In the cover page of the Book of Mormon, it tells us that it contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. The continuing revelation that is meant for our day will not provide further gospel truth. Continuing revelation should be inspiration to help us with issues of our days and our time. Pray for our leaders that they can be in tune with the Spirit and give us revelation for our days. Also, pray that they will be inspired to show us the truth about the gospel that we already have in new ways that we may be able to hopefully see it or understand it and be able to understand why the gospel is the good news. The most useful thing you can do when leaders of the church present the gospel to you is to turn to the Bible and Book of Mormon for clarification and verification. 2 Nephi 3.12 tells us that the Book of Mormon and the Bible shall be written and shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace and bringing us to the knowledge of our fathers in the latter days and also to the knowledge of the Lord's covenants. That is the heart of the Book of Mormon Scripture Challenge. For the strengthening of the saints by proving of God's word by these two holy texts. Please share your predictions and thoughts in the comment section below. Also, check out the other videos that I have recorded for preparing for this general conference, starting with episode 32 to episode 49 and 50. If you have any questions, you can check out the website at bomschallenge.org or send me an email at brother3tyler at gmail.com. Until next time.